With characters like Injustice Superman and the Batman Who Laughs recently gaining popularity and then losing it a month later by being in too many things all at once, I always wondered what it would be like for more Marvel characters to go bad in an alternate universe. We got Ultimate Reed Richards putting on a bionicle helmet and being a creepy weirdo, but not really an equivalent Justice Lords or Crime Syndicate. That's why I think it's really cool that the second Spider-Verse arc in Ultimate Spider-Man opted to do something we don't see often and create an evil Peter Parker. Now, the rules within this show's first few seasons is that everyone's a terrible person except Peter, and Peter's a nice guy, but he's insufferable, annoying, and unfunny. But those god-awful adaptations of their comic counterparts were later replaced with more Spider-themed team members, including a universe-displaced Brooklyn Spider-Man. After having him be a regular on the show for a while, a multiverse incursion begins due to the artifact that brought him to this universe, the Siege Perilous, being shattered. So, it's actually, it's pretty much just using the setup from Shattered Dimensions, and some of the visuals as well. Kind of neat that the cartoon is taking cues from the game for once instead of the other way around. So the two Spider-Men are off on a multiversal scavenger hunt to find all the pieces of the MacGuffin before anyone else can. The first weird universe they drop into is a Victorian London version of New York that's infested with vampires. Instead of being a loser supervillain who can't compress his web shooters small enough to fit in a watch and then gets killed by Venom, Blood Spider is this world's Peter Parker turned vampire hunter. I always thought Ben Diskin should get another chance at voicing Spider-Man after Ultimate Alliance 2, so this is cool to see. And he was Spider-Ham in these too. I also think having the King of the Vampires in this universe be the Lizard of all characters is a really fun comic booky choice. It's not obvious like having it just be Dracula or some Blade adjacent character. Plus, the character conflicts are more interesting here than the first Spider-Verse arc because Blood Spider wants to steal the Magic MacGuffin to finally kill all vampires, and Mr. No-Killing except when it's Wolverine and you're mad is like, nah, and has to come up with a non-lethal way to cure the vampires. Then we get a teaser at the villain Wolf Spider. It's overall a nice start to this arc, and doing one universe for the whole episode lets the plot have way more room to breathe. However, the next episode goes back to that 2-in-1 format, and they're both a lot more simple. These aren't any universes based directly on any comics, it's just PIRATE SPIDER-MAN and then COWBOY SPIDER-MAN! Which isn't all that creative, all things considered, but I do like this weird dysfunctional crew of Webbeard, Howard the Duck, and the Guardians of the Galaxy-themed pirate ship. And the cowboy world has Uncle Ben survive and be some kind of superheroic badass in Carter Slade's outfit. And his nephew learns the great responsibility lesson. So that's like a best case scenario. Usually universes where Uncle Ben lives lead to Peter growing up to be an irresponsible jerk. So this one's a happy accident. Part 3 is a lot stronger in my book when they go back to the noir dimension for one full episode. I think pulling in the Hulk for this world is a really clever idea because Joe Fixit fits right in with these characters and it's a great excuse for him to be gray instead of green. Plus you got Hammerhead and Mr. Negative as the villain, so it's a good time. I really like this one, though I'm not sure about making the black and white universe in color at the end. Sort of messes up their aesthetic, no? What, are you gonna go up to the cartoon universe again and turn everyone into normal animals? Leave them alone! The grayscale is the natural order of things here, you colorist bastards! I mean, colorist is in like the comic art thing, not as like a racial thing. Wolf Spider only gets a tiny part in this one to keep him in mind, but he doesn't really appear at all in part two. I think they could have tried harder to make that one tie in plot wise, or at least thematically with the other three episodes, since it really just feels like a filler adventure. Part four is where Peter and Miles go to the Brooklyn Spider-Man home dimension and we get even more small elements that would go on to inspire the Spider-Verse movie, including both Spider-Men being saved by Spider-Gwen! In this show, she's a non-superpowered human that gets spider powers from her costume, which is... Uh... I don't know, take it or leave it. But look, it's the Spider Cave, and it's managed by the Aunt May of the dead Peter Parker in Miles' home dimension. I also think this show partially inspired Insomniac's take on Miles by having his father die at some point and his mom supporting his superhero career as a single parent. After all the teasing, we finally get to meet Wolf Spider and learn what his plan is. He's going to turn himself into the toughest spider in the multiverse by draining the life force of all the others. Kinda like that The Amazing Spider guy from the Hulk, Deadpool, and Spidey crossover in the comics. Except that guy was trying to use the extra spider powers he stole to be a hero. 
Gwen stole that guy's name because she's really hard to market to the mainstream. I guess that's what you get when your character is basically like three inside jokes wrapped in one. Oh wait, no, that's Gwenpool. My world had a Miles Morales too, and your life will end as his did, in pain and misery by my hand! Wolf Spider is just an irredeemable evil scumbag, and it's pretty refreshing. Also, I love that Wolf Spider is voiced by Christopher Daniel Barnes to give this some ties back to Spider Wars. That voice! He sounds like me! Even that shows evil Spider-Man wanted some redemption. The only other completely evil Peter Parker I can think of is that cannibalistic super strong one from the universe where Punisher accidentally turned everyone into flesh-eating savages. But I think Wolf Spider has a cooler design and more staying power if they ever wanted to use him again. Plus, he's better at getting his Manny Petty appointments than the Zombie Lord guy. I can't say the climax makes a ton of sense. Wolf Spider absorbs all of the spiders and then Peter just allows himself to get got too, but thankfully is brought into this metaphorical astral plane thing to rally the other spider people to just like, escape. It's one of those willpower things, but I guess Pete's just lucky that it worked instead of your life force being absorbed and it all just goes dark or puts you in some kind of solo hellscape with no access to the other guys. On the off chance that there's some kind of afterlife when your soul is ripped out of your body via magic, I'll just rally everyone else's ghosts like in Finding Nemo to swim down to defeat the villain. Long gone are the days where Spider-Man outsmarts the bad guy in a clever way that exploits their strength against them. Now he just uses the power of friendship or whatever. You train the power of heroes. What's, what's happening to me? Was someone as evil as you? You poisoned yourself by taking our life forces. You drank too much good guy juice and it made your bad guy tummy hurt. Wait, that sounds weird. The day is saved and Miles makes a conscious decision to move into the other universe with his mom instead of getting put there by an omniscient god thing and then having really ambiguous memory of that for the next 10 years. Ultimate Spider-Man's two Spider-Verse events are some of the very first adaptations of the comic arc and they came out almost right after the book itself. Being as close in release as they are, the two of them seem to be companion pieces when looked at for future adaptations. Because he's so central to the interpersonal conflicts in the original story arc, where he and Peter are arguing for the position of the Spider-Verse leader, I'd have liked to see Superior Spider-Man in either of these arcs. But his cartoon debut wouldn't be until... Um... Well anyway, seeing as how these two arcs inspired a fair amount of story choices in the cinematic Spider-Verse, I'd hope that Wolf Spider could catch on in another medium too since we don't have like a recurring villain version of Peter Parker. Though for the moment it seems like the movies and comics will stick to pre-established villains from Spidey history for the multiversal events. If he does appear again though, he needs a better haircut. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years, not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist. If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If everyone who watched this video donated one dollar a month, I'd be able to afford a house for myself, so that would be, that would be really cool. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic, or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator quote XavierGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time.